The great thing about being a Christian, a believer, is that we are rest assured that our tomorrow is better. That's the truth. Your tomorrow is better. It can never be worse because you are in Christ Jesus. Let your hearts not be troubled. Jesus told them, he said, don't be troubled. Don't worry. Doesn't matter what you see now. Your tomorrow is better. Yeah. Have faith in God. Romans chapter 8, let's read from verse 14 to 19. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Take note, sons of God. The leading of God, if you are led by the Holy Spirit, you are classed as a son of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. There is a spirit called fear, but this Holy Ghost you have received is the one that gives you boldness. It's the one that gives you boldness regardless. It says, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We have the confidence to say, God is my father, because we know we have been adopted. The spirit itself buried weakness with our spirit. The spirit is saying that's true. What he's saying is true. When he says father, it's true, it's true. He's the child of God. He's the son of God. He said the spirit buried weakness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Jesus said greater works than this. This one I'm doing now. Watch out. You ought to beat it. And so the Bible tells us we are joint heirs with Christ. If so be, we suffer with him. That we may be also glorified with him. Glory has weight. For I reckon that the sufferings of these present times are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please take your seat. The world is waiting for you, city of God. Nothing is moving because you have not made it move. The errors that you see is because you permitted it. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestations or manifestation of the sons of God. And we saw in verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We are looking at living in the presence of God. We just concluded our conference, the presence and the power. So we want to look at the presence of God. We want to live in the presence of God. Daily, perpetually. The presence of God doesn't end at the door. It doesn't only occur when you are in church. When we say, take the Holy Ghost. And sometimes we see the manifestation where we see people fall or people turn around, people shake. That is not a proof that the Holy Ghost is there. That you didn't fall, that you didn't shake, doesn't mean the Holy Ghost or his presence wasn't there. It may happen. It's good it happens. Why? So that it will help some unbelief. However, as you grow in the things of God, you know that the Holy Ghost is bigger than shaking. It's bigger than falling. It may happen. I've fallen many times under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So I know. However, I know that that I didn't fall doesn't mean the Holy Ghost is not here. You don't need to fall today. The Holy Ghost is here. Amen. The presence of God is here. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 
the evidence is a change that happens. If you fall and get up, no change. Mm. There's a question mark. The change. Holy Ghost brings change. Change. Peter, timid t Peter, when the Holy Ghost came, Jesus said, don't move. Don't go without the Holy Ghost. You won't be able to survive it. But when the day of Pentecost was fully come, when the Holy Ghost descended, we saw a different man standing and preaching and thousands repented. Glory to God, the Holy Ghost. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, they are the sons of God. I want to tell you that some of the changes that you are desiring, some of the things you want to see happen, is bigger than a child. I will explain it to you. We need to get into sonship. Where we are able to demonstrate the power of God as God wants us to. Children can demonstrate it. Isaiah 9, 6 began to tell us that children, unto us a child is born. But unto us a son is given. Sons are given. That's it. Unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. Look at what happens when you have a son. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Children can handle some things. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus is our role model. The Bible is telling us here that yes, children are born when you give birth to children, but sonship comes with maturity. And when a son is given, the difference is we see that the government was upon the shoulders of Jesus. Yet he was born a son, but he grew. He is a son of God. Why? Because of responsibility. So I'll be speaking to us this morning about living in the presence of God. It comes with responsibility. If we are going to live in the presence of God, you can't live in and out of the presence of God. It's not a good thing. Oh, the Holy Ghost moved today. What about tomorrow? Is he resting? No, it's not resting. We need to grow into that sonship where we know that the Spirit of God is abiding in us continually. And if we are led by the Holy Ghost, that is a sign of maturity. We live in his presence continually. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 30 from verse 11 to 16, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from you. This is not a secret. Neither is it far from off. In other words, God is not in the business of picking and choosing and say, this man will be the man that will only live in my presence. It's a big secret, so it's only for him. Verse 12, it is not in heaven that thou should say or should I say, who will go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and we may do it. Verse 13, neither is it beyond the sea that thou should I say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very night unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See, I have set this day, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. 16. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his status and his judgment, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess it. God is saying, what he has commanded, what he has left us to do, it is not in heaven. You don't need anybody to go to heaven to pull it down. Somebody will say, that's Old Testament. Jesus showed us again in the New Testament in Romans chapter 10. Go to Romans chapter 10, the same words. 
verse 6 to 8. Romans 10, verse 6 to 8. We'll see. That it is not in heaven. You don't need to travel to heaven, then come back with it. Are we there? Media help us. 6 to 8. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. That was what Deuteronomy was saying, what God was saying to them. Say not in your heart, who shall go where? Ascend into heaven. Who is going to go for us to heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above so that the presence of God will be moving. No, you don't need that. Verse 8. Or who shall descend into the deep? Deuteronomy says, who will go over the sea, the deep? To bring up Christ again from the dead. No. To live in the presence of God, the first thing you need is that you must know his word. You must know God's word for yourself. Living in the presence of God is every man's responsibility. It is not something mechanical where we just... Charge up, charge up, charge up. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the presence of God. <sighs> then we rest. No. God wants us to live a life perpetually under his influence. Where he's leading us by his Holy Spirit. That way we live in his presence continually. How do we do this? By knowing his word. The reason most people struggle... To remain in the presence of God is because they don't know the word of God. If you don't know the word of God, you will struggle. Verse 11 of Deuteronomy told us that it is not hard. You don't need to, it's not hanging in heaven and needs to be pulled down. It's here with you. How do you know that, pastor? Because the Holy Ghost is in you. It's here. It's the Holy Ghost. When you receive the Holy Ghost, it is not for decoration. It is not to be used only when you are amongst the brethren. I want to show everybody that I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. No, do it at home. Do it on the streets. Do it as the occasion demands. Let him lose. Let the Holy Ghost go to work in your life. Hallelujah. You must know the word of God. If you don't know the word of God, the Holy Ghost or the presence of God will be scarce. It will be scarce. The word of God. And I read in the book of Luke chapter 24. Let's look at Luke chapter 24. And I'll read from verse 13. You must know the word of God. These are two men discussing about the events that, were, that just happened. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Amos, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all things which had happened. They were discussing, discussing what had happened. And it came to pass that while they were communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near. Your conversation has the power to attract the presence of God. There are a lot of useless conversations that we make that just makes the presence of God stay far. This one, they were having a conversation about the Lord Jesus. And as they were talking about what had happened, do you know what scripture says? They were talking about his death. Now they say he's risen. How could this be? The Bible says Jesus was drawing near. You can attract the presence of the Holy Ghost. Just like you can repel it. There are certain conversations that causes the Holy Ghost or the presence of God to be far. You know them. Because when you have such conversations within yourself, you know. You know. You don't need anybody to tell you. You just know. And sometimes we use the word, I've talked too much today. You talk and talk. When you live there yourself, you are thinking about what you said. Some of it you can't remember because it's a lot of rubbish. 
So the Bible tells us here that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. He went with them. Jesus liked this conversation because it was about him. They were, the Bible says, they were talking about it. They were communing together. They were not gossiping. They were communing together and they were reasoning. How many times do we have conversation that doesn't cause our brain to think? Believers, we are born again. God wants you to use your brains. Reason it. There's no problem that you cannot reason through. Reason it through. As we call them meditating. As you reason it, an answer will come. Not grumble. Reason it. The challenge that you are facing now, as an answer. There's no challenge without an answer. The problem is that you've not found it. That you don't have the answer doesn't mean it doesn't have answer. You have not found it. They commune together. Communing means one person is not trying to have his own opinion. I'm the one, right? Because most times, even when we meet in Bible study, we want to show that we know scripture very well. But the Bible says we should commune with one another. Commune. So that we can engage our minds. So we can open up for the Holy Ghost to speak. Hallelujah. They reasoned together. They reasoned together. Verse 16 is quite key. It says, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another? As ye walk and are sad. The communication they were having was one that was bringing sadness. Jesus is speaking to us this morning and asking us, what is this communication you are having? After you finish it, husband and wife, everybody's upset. Everybody's anger is up. We are boiling. Jesus is saying, what kind of communication are you having? Your communication matters. Yes, it can attract the Lord. It can also cause you to be put in a wrong state of mind. Nobody has done it to you. It's your communication that has done it. And Jesus asks them the question, what manner of communication are you having? Because he's risen. But they are sad. Why? They are communing in ignorance. And the one of them whose name was Cleopas answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and has not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? You know how we, we speak to God as if he's not aware. He doesn't know your troubles. He doesn't know your challenge. He doesn't know your pain. Jesus says, what is it? What are these things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have crucified him, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, the certain and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre, the grave, the tomb. And when they found not his body, they came saying, that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even so as a woman had said, or women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? 
And being at most, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures, and they rose up the same hour, returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven together, saying, and this is what they said, The Lord is risen indeed, and thou appeared and had appeared to Simeon, and they told that what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and he said, Peace be unto thee. And I'll jump to verse 45. Then opened he their understanding that they, should, they might understand the scripture. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved, Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Hallelujah. Amen. This is a long read, but a good read. When we read that scripture, the Bible tells us something there. Jesus began to speak to his people, or these two men. And when he began to speak to them, the Bible makes us know that while Jesus with them, was with them, they couldn't recognize him. They didn't know it was Jesus. And they began to be, you know, very sorrowful because of the event of things. There's somebody here this morning that you are sorrowful about what has happened. It doesn't mean Jesus is not aware. Jesus knows what has happened. And it is okay for you to describe what has happened. For humans, it helps us to unburden our minds. So don't think you cannot unburden yourself. You can still say it, even though Jesus knew. And when they had done this, Jesus began to speak to them about scriptures. He began to open scriptures to them. He began to tell them the words. I believe they were so sorrowful because they had lost hope. They said, we had believed, we had thought that this is the one that will save us. This is the one that will redeem us. But alas, he was taken away from us. He was actually killed. We all saw him die. I want to say to you this morning, if for any reason, because of the situation of life, it looks as if what you thought would have happened didn't happen, it doesn't mean that God has failed. Jesus began to say to them, did you not know that I ought to suffer this many things? And I said in the first service, suffering is part of the gospel. I know we are used to the blessing, which is true. But the Bible teaches us that if we must share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Take your own portion. But what we try to balance is for you not to make the mistake that this is the devil that is that is actually inflicting this pain on you. Because if it's the devil, it's illegal. And you must stop it. You don't permit it. However, the gospel has the part where it is called the suffering of Jesus and the glory of Jesus. We partake of both. Where we read earlier, Romans tells us we are joint heirs. You know what heir means? What you inherit. You inherited the suffering. When men rail at you because of your good works, because you live a righteous life, you know this is a standard of God. And even though in the world we live in today, the world teaches us otherwise. But when we look at scripture, 
the scripture tells us, no, this is how Christ says we live. And we live by that word. Then you begin to hear comments. You know they are throwing it at you. There's no need to be upset. It is the suffering of Jesus. You partake of it. And so Jesus began to expand to them and said, did you not know that Christ ought to suffer and to die and to be buried like every other man? But on the third day, he would rise again. And Jesus said something. He called them foolish. And I said this morning, every time you don't know God's word, it's not me. Jesus says you are foolish. You are foolish. Why? Because the enemy will take advantage of you. He will take advantage of your emotions. When you should not be sad, you will be sad. You would have wasted your time crying. It's a waste of time. When you ought to put that time and energy into something that will produce for you. But if you know scriptures, you know that these two shall pass. That's what the Bible says. It says, and it came to pass. Everything has an expiry date. Every challenge in life has an expiry date. You may not know the date. Just like every product you go and buy in the shop. By law, there must be an expiry date. It must expire. The Bible says, after you have suffered what? A while. A while means it has an expiry date. And Jesus said, did you not know that on the third day he will rise? I will rise again. And the Bible began to show us something very profound. He said, when they got, remember they were going somewhere. When they got to their destination, Jesus now said to them as though he was going to carry on on his own journey. But these two men... Thank God for their life. He said they compelled him. They said, don't go. Don't go. Every time you are receiving God's word, don't cut it short. World Changers Conference may have ended, but don't end it in your life. It doesn't mean that the word should cease in your life. When Sunday service is over, don't stop hearing God's word. We are living in a generation and a time where the word of God is so common it's not scarce how do i know that if you go to youtube you find god's word if you go to facebook you find god's word just name it twitter there's god's word there so what is your excuse that is why god has positioned you at such a time as this so you live in his presence how by knowing god's words how do you know god's word you keep receiving it you keep receiving it. You allow it continually flow in your life. You are absolutely responsible for that. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. How is it going to dwell in you richly? When you open yourself up for the word. And they said to him, he said, don't go, don't go. Come and stay with us tonight. Don't go. And Jesus stayed. Every time you invite the word, it comes. What you celebrate will stay. What you don't celebrate will not stay. If I come to your house once and I perceive that I'm not welcome, you will never see me. What's the point? It's the same with the word of God. If you esteem God's word, it will want to remain. If you don't esteem it, you treat it lightly. It doesn't really matter. Uh, no, 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 no. You big, speak big English. That is fine. It will go to where it will be esteemed. Even God says, my word have I highly what? Exalted. God says he exalts his own word. So the word of God will only abide, will remain where it is celebrated. Celebrate God's word in your life. When you celebrate God's word in your life, you will pursue after it. And this man... When they got to their destination, they said, please don't go stay. And he stayed. They continued. They continued with the word. And as they continued, remember what we saw earlier. When he was talking to them on the way, their eyes were still blind. 
they still didn't recognize Jesus. However, they said later that their hearts were burning, but they didn't recognize him. So imagine if they have allowed him just carry on going. They will still remain with that blind eyes. How many times have we stopped the breakthrough before the breakthrough came? Because we thought, oh, they've just, they, we've just finished it now. They, they just laid hand, they prophesied, which is all well and good. But don't stop there. Don't stop there. Continue to discover God's word. Make war with the prophetic word, the word of God that has gone forth before you. Continue to hold on to it. And the Bible says he decided to break bread. You don't break bread. He didn't break bread on the way. As you give God more time with his word, what you are doing is you are giving yourself more opportunity to be blessed. Amen. Above and beyond. There are blessings and there are blessings. There are blessings that are called fearful blessings. It is not going to happen in five minutes. Most times it doesn't just happen when you come and do your two hour service. It is accumulation of the word over time. Then when the breakthrough happens, people think, oh, it was just that one. It's not just that one. How many times have you seen preachers? Oh, I didn't know. And he said, I've been a minister for 20 years. You didn't know him when he started. It's over time. Words is the same thing. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus stayed, he broke bread, and the moment he gave it to them, their eyes opened. And they began to know what Jesus was talking about. And they began to understand. Even though an angel had come and had told the women, there was still doubt in the air. But by reason of the word of God that went on for a good amount of time, that opened their understanding, Jesus said, he opened their understanding that they might understand scriptures. For you to know scriptures, you need the Holy Ghost. Don't go and say, I'm going to bring Jesus. He has left the Holy Ghost here. That will help us to understand, to know scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 9 to 10. If you want to live in the presence of God perpetually, which is God, what God recommends, for you to deliver in this end time the mind of God, you must learn to know God's word. Learning to know God's word means you must be willing to put in the time. Put in the time, put in the effort. 9 to 10 says, but as it is written, I had not seen, nor ear heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man, the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Love requires time. But God had revealed them unto us by what? His spirit. For the spirit searched all things. Yea, the deep things of God. You want to know the word of God. Invest your time in knowing God's word. When you invest time, you are allowing the Holy Ghost to teach you. That you are in a hurry doesn't mean the Holy Ghost is in a hurry. Find time. Somebody once said, you are so busy, you are so busy. Have you ever missed the way to your house? <laughs> hurry, 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 hurry. Have you ever missed the way to your house? What you value, you will find time for. Find time for the word of God. That is how the Holy Ghost will reveal what the Father has, the secret things the Father has in store for you. The next way is by choice. You are absolutely responsible for yourself. Every man is responsible for himself. That's why on the judgment day, I will be answering for only myself, only me. Only me. I don't even know if I recognize you on the judgment day. I will be fully focused on myself because the question will be directed at me. That's the truth. So, in living in the presence of God, you have a choice. And let me break it down into three parts in making this choice. That's why when we read in Deuteronomy where God was saying, he said, choose. Choose life 
and blessing or death and destruction or curses. But we choose life. It's easy to just say it. Isn't it? I choose life. What you do is what determines your choice. It's the doing that shows the choice. It's not the just there. Mm. So, how do I make my choice? One of the ways we make our choice, I put it, number one, is that you must be a clean vessel. You must be a clean vessel. Holy. Isaiah began to tell us, 52 verse 11, Depart ye, depart ye. Go ye out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessel of the Lord. Put NIV. Depart, depart. Go out from there. Somebody, God is telling you, get out of there. You know you need to get out of there. You know you need to get out of there. How long will you remain there? That you want to be there doesn't mean the Holy Spirit wants to be there. There are places you are in. There are relationships you are in now. The Holy Ghost says, I don't want to be in it. You say you want to be in it. Know that you are on your own. It's not a cause. That's the truth. Those people that are parents, you know. The children that you have now, that you are responsible for. If the child tells you, I want to go so and so. If you don't want to go, that child can't go. Isn't it? The child can't go. But with the Holy Ghost, God is so wonderful. He's not a tyrant. He gives us the power of choice. If you like. If you don't like. Whichever one you choose, you will bear the responsibility. Full time. And he's telling us, you need to come out from it and be pure. You who carry the vessels of God. When we talk about vessel, it's a container, true? We are talking about the presence of God. If you want to walk with God, you must learn to come out from those unclean things. I don't need to list it because you know. The Holy Ghost is inside of you. The Bible has shown us. It says it's inside. The word is in your heart. It's already there. Why is it in your heart? One of the things about the word of God is that it is sown. Once he gets there, he's sown. You may not see it growing, but that is how the word of God is. The kingdom of God. It's like a man that goes out to sow seeds. Day and night, he doesn't know how he's growing, but he's growing. The word of God. The Holy Ghost is inside you. It's in your heart. And it is near you, even in your mouth. So you know those unclean things that you must come out of. And those childish behavior, remember we looked at scripture where it says, this world is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It's not for children. They can't handle it. So we must grow out of childishness. We maybe have been born as children, but God wants us to grow. And as we are growing, please grow out of the childishness. We see that, in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11, then we look at Galatians, why we must grow out of childishness. He says, when I was a child, I did what? I talked like a child. I taught like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I did what? Put away childish ways behind me. You can't be a man and be behaving like a child. You can't. You can't. Childish way. They didn't visit me. They didn't visit me. They didn't visit me. How many have you visited? If we visit only you, what about the baby Christian, the one that gave birth to their life, to Christ yesterday? You are 10 years in the Christian face. You are still opening your mouth to say they didn't visit you. Five years in the faith. You are still complaining that you were not visited. What time will we have for the people that just discovered that Jesus is Lord? If we leave them to be visiting you. You have headache, we didn't visit you. You have leg pain, we didn't visit you. You slept and you woke up on the wrong side of the bed, we didn't visit you. 
When I became a man, I put away what? It's, all, it's signs of immaturity. That's the truth. It's signs of immaturity. You are born again one year, two years. Your language should change now. Your language should change. It should change. You should be the one coming to tell us the first timers that we didn't see last Sunday. You should be telling us if we miss them, your language should change. Hallelujah. I put away childish what? Ways. Somebody tell your neighbor, put away childish ways. Put it away. Hallelujah. We are talking about the presence of God. Are we understanding? The presence of God. Have you been in, a, in an atmosphere where it is so petty? You just want to get out. Very petty. He said, I said that you said that you said. That I said you said you said. Put away childish ways. There are ways that children behave. We know them. They throw tantrum. That is a sign of a child. If they don't have their way, what do they do? Tantrum. If you are still throwing tantrum, you are a child. You may be 10 years in the faith, but you have not grown. If it was the real world, we would diagnose it. Is that not true? We have to. So we have different labelings. So we put away childish behavior. Why? It's important we do that. If you look at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, 1 to 6. Let's look at when a child refuses or when, when, when we have a child that is supposed to be ruling. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, take note, he's a child. He will not put away childish behavior. He will not grow up. He likes to be spoon-fed. Except you come to church, you will never read the Bible. Except they read the Bible for you, you will never open the Bible. Except they say, shall we all pray? You have not prayed all week. Are you seeing it? It's childishness. It's childishness. As long as he's a child, he's different nothing, different nothing from a servant. There's no difference between you or not you. The child and the unbeliever. So that's why you see the language of a child, it will be the same as the language as of an unbeliever. That's why I say it's not different from that of a servant. Although he is Lord of what? All. Verse 2. But he's under tutors and governors until the appointed time of the father. Let me help you. These tutors and governors, they are not kind, though. They are not kind. Verse 3. Even so, we, when we were children, we were in bondage. Can you see that? He's a child. He's born again, but he's a child. What is he under? They are in bondage under the elements of what? This world. So if the world is suffering from leukemia, don't worry, that child eh, is under the same element. Heaven help that child. My back is paining me, my this, my that. Under the element, I'd like you to understand, I'm not saying you are a sinner. But you must understand that there are men that are sons that are walking in, in, as heirs with the, with the Lord Jesus that are not under the elements of this world. The elements of this world is the sickness that the world suffers. That's the same sickness the child will suffer. The lack that the world suffers, that's what the child will still suffer. But he's Lord of all. He's supposed to be living in abundance. But because he's a child, whatever the world is suffering, they will suffer it. That is the danger. That's why the Bible says you must put away childish ways, childish behavior. Because it's a risk. It's a risk. Hallelujah. So we've looked at that. We must be a clean vessel. Clean vessel means we grow in maturity. We don't go where the Holy Ghost doesn't want to go. We don't mix up. 
And the next thing is that we must be sanctified. We must be sanctified. Exodus chapter 19. Verse 10 to 15. Exodus 19. Let's read that. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow. And let them wash their clothes. One translation says, Go unto the people and let them sanctify themselves again. They may have done it. Maybe something went along the way. There's a bit of death. God said, Go and do it. So let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. God is coming down. Read on. Verse 13. Oh, 12. Go back to 12, please. Verse 12. And thou shalt set bounds upon the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourself. That ye go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Where whosoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. A translation says, set boundaries around the people. Sanctification, put boundaries in your life. God says, put boundaries around these people. Any man that does not have boundary in his life is a risk. Anything goes. It's a risk. He said, put boundaries. It says, there shall not an hand, no hand may touch the person or animal that crosses the boundary. Instead, stone them or shoot them with arrows. They must be put to death. However, when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, then the people may go up on the mountain. So Moses went down to the people. He consecrated them for worship and they washed their clothes. Verse 15. He told them, get ready for the third day. And until then, abstain from having sexual intercourse. In other words, I said in this verse 15, when you read this scripture, God was teaching us when it comes to sanctification, there are levels of sanctification. That was what that verse 15 was saying. One translation says, stay away from your wife. Don't have sexual uh, relationships because I'm coming. In other words, God is saying there are levels to sanctification. Some of you, God has given you your own sanctification. But you, because you want to be like the other person, you copy and copy and copy and even copy their damnation. You copy everything. You copy there are levels of sanctification. It's a set boundaries on these people. Let them have boundaries. When you read verse 18, you see God come down with fire. Sanctification is so important. It takes sanctification to receive God's arrival without casualties. If you are not sanctified and God comes, you will die. That's why he told them. He said, go and tell them to clean up. I'm coming. I need these people to be sanctified. It also requires holiness. Holiness is just double sanctification. God requires it. He said, be ye holy. For I, the Lord, I am holy. It is so important that we live a sanctified life. God does not want us to just go about life without boundaries. Do not remove the old landmark. Go and have people that shifted the boundaries. God put it here. They push it. Just a little is a risk. The Bible says, put boundaries. Anybody that passed that boundary, they, they don't, don't let them come back. You know. Don't even touch them. Stone them. Shoot them. It's so important. John 17, 17 tells us something. They put John 17. So you don't say this is just Old Testament. It doesn't matter. Pastor, it doesn't matter. Let's read it together. Sanctify them by what? The truth. Your word is truth. God still requires it today. He still requires it today. It's not old time religion. It's not. Is the word of God. I discovered that wherever you go, the Bible is universal. 
we are very good at saying the culture of this land. No, it, it doesn't apply. It applies everywhere. It's you that it doesn't apply to because you refuse to follow it. The Bible is universal. And when we look at this, we are still looking at making your choice. It's a choice. Under this is conviction. Conviction that leads to righteousness. Every time you know God convicts your heart. You know, you hear questions like, Pastor, I just want to ask. Mm, is drinking alcohol, I won't be intoxicated. Is it a sin? Actually, the Lord has convicted you on that particular issue. Do you understand? So what you want now is validation to be disobedient. So the best thing is I will also trade back at you. Go and pray. Go and pray about it. I cannot validate it. Go and pray. And when you are praying, open up your spirit to hear the word of God. I don't know. We all have our convictions. One tribe, God said to them, he said, don't cut your hair. Another one, the father told them, he said, don't drink. It's forbidden. So, so you know, you know. You know what God has convicted you of. You know. So conviction that will lead to righteousness. And let me say here, when you are convicted and it leads to righteousness, what happens to you is that it releases the power of God in your life. Miracles begin to happen naturally. Signs break forth in your life. If you read the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2 from verse 37 to 43, you see where Peter preached the word of God. And after that, when the people, the Bible said they were convicted in their heart, they repented, they began to repent, they lived right. And the Bible says, God began to wrought miracles. Signs and miracles. Just follow the convictions of the Holy Ghost. Miracles, signs, they are something that should be natural. Not just to you, but through you to the world. The world is waiting for you. Hallelujah. Now, the last one is that we must learn to stay the course. Stay the course. If this is what God has said, you know that's what God has said. Stay there. Stay the course. Don't turn away from it. Deuteronomy talks about, verse 17 tells us, it says, but if you turn, if you turn, God is never pleased when we turn. Stay the course. Don't change what you believe. That you haven't seen it doesn't make God's word of none effect. God is true and every man is a liar. Don't change. Don't change your language. Don't change your belief that God is able to do all that he says he will do. God says you will live in health. Don't change it. God says you will live in prosperity. Don't change it. That's what he says. If we look at Hebrews chapter 10, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39. Hold on to every promise of God, but we are not of them. We are not like those people who draw back, who turn back unto destruction, perdition, but we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Can you put C-E-V? Put C-E-V if you have it. Thank you. We are not like those people who turn back. When they turn back, what happens? They get destroyed. We will keep on having faith. When? Until we are saved. Until you stay the course. You hold on. Keep believing God until it happens. It hasn't happened yet. Hold on. Until it happens. You stay the course. God began to tell us about Ephraim. The Bible tells us there about him. He said, Ephraim was armed with bows. When the battle came, he was carrying bows for battle. Yet, he turned back. Psalm 30, 78 verse 9. He said, yet, when he saw battle, what did Ephraim do? He turned back. Look at it. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, they turned back in the day of battle. Let me explain it to you. These were men that had the promises of God. They knew what the word of God said. That's what you have. 
What you have is promise. What you have is the word of God. That is a weapon. For the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. They are, not, they are weapons. Weapons of war that can bring down any onslaught of the enemy, any adversary, any principality, any power. He brings it down. The Bible says they turn back in the day of battle. There's always a day of battle. There's always a day of battle. Why? God allows it because you need to sometimes exercise these weapons. It's important. If you look at different countries that have weapons, from time to time, they just go and shoot. You, have, you don't wait till the battle comes before you shoot. How do you know it will, it will, it will launch on that day? So you, you look at it. America, they go and do exercise with South Korea. They are testing their weapon and also sending a message to the enemy. We are still here. Careful. Careful. God is teaching us. When challenges come, all these things he has equipped you with, it is not for decoration. Use it. Engage with it. Don't run away. Speak the word of God and you will see the mountains come down. Shall we rise to our feet as we begin to pray? Somebody you are saying, I'm going to live in the presence of God. I'm going to walk in the consciousness of the presence of God. I will not back down. I will not back out. I'm going to invest time with the word of God. I will equip myself. Every opportunity to grow, I will take advantage. Take advantage. Every opportunity to grow. Now make this your choice. Decide. This is my choice. That I will live the blessed life. I will live the blessed life. I will live a life that my vessel is clean. I will live a sanctified life. A holy life. When I'm convicted of the Holy Spirit, I will have the boldness to also go through with what God has convicted me of. And I will stay the course. I will not turn back. Somebody open your mouth and pray. Mashata legede kila babo shata. Leta manakata hile bado shata. Father, in the name of Jesus, repe pepe tu la palakata. Meku parakate keleba. Libra katakata. I will engage my mind. I will engage my conversation. I will engage my reasoning with the word of God. Mekete lozu palakata. Shanda kalakata. Lizi kalebo shata legede malakota lakata. Libro kota matali katakata. Le kata da 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 bosha katakata. Rikete kete ke palato sakete. Rapa pa 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 pa. No more shortcuts. Rikapa. No more moving the boundaries. Rikete le kota la palakata. Rikete ke palakata. I clean up this morning. I clean up. I clean up because the presence of God. God is abiding in me. I have the Holy Ghost. I have the Holy Ghost. I have the Holy Ghost to take this city. I have the Holy Ghost to live right. In the name of the Lord Jesus. If you are listening to me this morning and you are saying, Pastor, I want you to join faith with me, to pray with me. I want to live a consecrated life. There's no habit that cannot be broken. There's no evil habit that cannot be broken. The power of God is greater. There is no lifestyle contrary to that which God has set that cannot be put to stop. You are going to put your hand on your chest and I'm going to pray for you. 
I speak that the power of God will enter into you now. You will hear the voice of God saying this is the way that you should go. And the grace and the ability, the power to go that way. You receive it now in the name of Jesus. You receive it now in the name of Jesus. You receive it now in the name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. Go forward. Go forward. Make progress. Advance. Let signs and miracles begin to work in your life as you take this first step in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody bless the name of the Lord. Exalt him and thank him. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory. We honor you and exalt you for what you have done. I speak, Lord, that your word will run swiftly here today. That every man under the sound of my voice, they live in the atmosphere of the Holy Ghost. They live in the presence of God. They carry the presence of God. Therefore, principalities and powers, they are subdued as they enter. As they enter a place because of your presence that they carry. Lord, it answers to them in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are going to share the grace. But before we share the grace, couple of announcements. Don't forget, tomorrow is Bible study. We no longer stream online. So if you want to increase, you want to know God's word, you need to be in the house. It is live. It is live. Bible study. On Wednesday is a communion service. We saw in scripture in the book of Luke. As their eyes were open, were still shut, even though he was speaking to them, they couldn't comprehend it. But when he broke bread, the Bible says, and he gave them, they ate, their eyes were open. There's something about the body and the blood of Jesus. Every blindness, every covering cast cannot stand it. It must open up for you. Wednesday is our communion service and our prayer service. You are invited. And Sunday we carry on with two services and I know God will do you good. Don't forget if you are a couple, you invest in what is profitable, what is your value. Today is the last day to see with Sister Victoria and register your interest as a couple. We'll be going away and God will be equipping us in the name of Jesus. There will be no divorce in our midst. That's not the mind of God. Don't worry about what you hear, what you see, or what you have experienced. We are talking about moving forward. The word of God is supreme. It's above every ideology. Come and invest in your relationship. I believe that's it. Praise God.